Good evening. Tonight, part of the lecture will be given by Naina Tromp, and I'll introduce her to you in about 20 minutes. This year will mark, on the 11th of July, the 20th anniversary of the killings at Srebrenica in Bosnia, the worst atrocity committed in Europe since the Second World War. And there'll be many events in Bosnia and at Srebrenica with lectures around the world. And here is one more, or to be precise, two more. Um, because I have some special knowledge, I felt I couldn't let the event pass. Through what lens should we look at Srebrenica? Must it be through the lens of law and legal procedure? I think not. And in preparing this lecture, I found my own uh, opinions changing in unforeseen ways um, that have set this view. Tonight, we will consider the events and the crime of genocide generally. The next lecture will consider the role of individuals and of the international community who, despite what things, how things may seem, may have known in advance that Srebrenica would be taken. First, some bits of history. The breakup of the former Yugoslavia involved the, the Bosnian Serbs you can see Bosnia there, and we'll come to that in a second. The Bosnian Serbs in Bosnia, they formed their own entity, the Republika Srpska, that had its own government and its own army. It wanted to gain independence from Bosnia itself and to join Serbia in order to form a contiguous and larger Serbian state. To achieve this, it needed to take corridors of land atop and on the east and it took them by force. These corridors of land did not have natural Serb majorities. Three enclaves, of many as, as many of you will remember, of non-Serbs, Srebrenica's Jepa and Gorazda, were protected by the United Nations from 1993 and until 1995, when Srebren Srebrenica and Jepa fell. Serbia proper, the bigger bit of red on the right-hand side, you can see Srebrenica marked there in Bosnia. Srebrenica proper, proper was actively involved with the Bosnian Serb army, which it supported. It paid and pensioned the officers of that army at overtime rates because they were at war, three times the normal rate, but has always maintained it wasn't, it, Serbia wasn't engaged in the war. And then when Srebrenica fell to the Serb forces in July and thereafter, um, uh, some 8,000 men and boys were killed without reason by the forces of Serb or Serbia. Let's have a word about genocide. Genocide became a crime that could be charged in indictments against war criminals almost by accident. But its role in our lives may be much broader than simply as a defined crime. Victims and the bereaved of the Srebrenica that you see marked there inevitably think of the massacre from which they suffered as genocide. And indeed, it was found to be genocide committed by the army of the Bosnian Serbs, not by Serbia, by the International Court of Justice in a case brought by Bosnia against Serbia and against the officers of the Bosnian Serb army by the Yugoslav Tribunal. Victims and bereaved probably cannot accept and maybe barely can understand the judgment of the International Court of Justice that said that Serbia itself was not responsible for genocide and that its responsibility was limited to not having done more to stop genocide once it was underway. So that's where we are with Srebrenica genocide. No one from Serbia convicted, some from the Republic of Srpska convicted, including of genocide, a couple of cases, Mladic and Karadic, still to be completed, and a couple on appeal. Twenty years after the killings, this year's anniversary will have many never-again expressions of hope, many apologies or near apologies from those whose conduct cannot altogether be overlooked. It will possibly show again the disappointment in judicial processes and the law itself of those who mourn the 8,000 fathers, brothers, sons, grandsons who perished. Next topic and next important bit of history, um, Raphael Lemkin, who you see lived 59 years. 
Rather than weary with you with too much detail about genocide law, I will argue that genocide now is a concept invaluable to us all that is owned by the people and not by the lawyers. A consequence of this is that what the law provides for crimes, such as happened at Srebrenica, may disappoint people. And to make this point good, I should start, set out a little more about Raphael Lemkin, who, ter who coined the term genocide in the 1940s. Lemkin was a Polish Jew. Some 49 of his family members died in the Holocaust. And his control was with the control of conflict by law and was apparent from an early age when, as a Polish state lawyer prosecutor, um, he started to think of a crime that could stop people doing the terrible things that they regularly do. He was, I think, inspired by the Armenian massacre, celebrating 100 or marked by 100 years uh, this very year, by the Assyrian massacre of 1933, and also by the Ukrainian killings by the, U by the Soviet Union through starvation at about the same time. And he, at a conference in Madrid in 1933, was talking about a crime of barbarism or vandalism. Well, that lost him his job. Uh, he resigned and went off into private practice. And although his concern was to get legal instruments which could make acts illegal that were regularly enough performed by states, he saw things in a way very different from the way genocide is conceived of by us today. And he proposed the definition of genocide that embraced non-physical means of the destruction of communities, not just the destruction of communities by mass killings. And indeed, you won't be able to see it terribly easily. It's my fault for having two of us here, no screen. I'll have to read bits of it to you. But you'll have it in the handout. He conceived of genocide, as the, the crime was later to be termed, as actions that destroy the foundation of lives of national groups with the aim of annihilating the groups themselves. He conceived of genocide as directed at a national group but operating through the individuals who were attacked by whatever means, not in their individual capacity, but simply because they were members of the national group. And he conceived of this crime having two phases. First, the oppressor destroys the national pattern of the oppressed group and then substitutes its own pattern, either by colonization, having kicked everyone out, or by imposing its will on those it has subjugated. The account of his determination, Lemkin's determination, let's go back and look at him, to get a genocide convention passed should be inspiring. He lobbied country after country after the Second World War to get a genocide convention as redrafted passed by the Gen General Assembly, working tirelessly in his shabby stain suit, not eating properly, and seemingly having few real friends, for there were only seven present at his funeral. But this tragic, this man with a really tragic life, only his brother and sister-in-law and their two children, and he survived, has changed the way every reasonably well-educated man and woman on this planet thinks. Just think about that. An astonishing achievement. And he's dealt with the way that we can behave and think in the very heart of darkness that lies within us once we become packs, not people. Our language that so often determines not just what we say but what we think has been enriched by understanding in the one word that he coined what from well before the Armenian massacres had been the experience of countless victims of a crime without a name. And that phrase was coined by Churchill in a speech in 1941 on the basis of intelligence he'd received about what was happening in Germany and Lemkin picked it up and it was part of the stimulus for him creating the term. He was driven 
by recognition of what the non-lawyer understands and fears quite as well, that we will go on doing what humans have done unless we're stopped. Here's another man, worth a moment or so of your attention, Benjamin Ferenc, because he somewhat followed in the footsteps of Lemkin, and he's the last surviving prosecutor for the Nuremberg trials, from the Nuremberg trials. He prosecuted not the main trial, but the following Einsatzgruppen trial of mobile death squads operating in Nazi-occupied Eastern Europe, who between 1941 and 43 alone murdered more than one million Jews in various uh, ways. Now, in his opening speech, and I've got a couple of very short clips to play you, in his opening speech you'll see what Farron said. Can we play the first two, please? For the methodical execution of long-range plans to destroy ethnic, national, political, and religious groups which stood condemned in the Nazi mind. Genocide, the extermination of whole categories of human beings, was a foremost instrument of the Nazi doctrine. An assault, punishable in itself, may be part of the graver offense of robbery, and it is proper pleading to charge both of the crimes. So here, the killing of defenseless civilians during a war may be a war crime, but the same killings are part of another crime, a graver one, if you will, genocide, or a crime against humanity. Thank you. So here was a man using a term not yet uh, in law that he knew had been coined by the man he knew quite well, Lemkin, and introducing it into the legal discourse. And this demonstrates that people can have concepts they don't of their own. They don't always need to come from lawyers. Ben Ferrens, after the war, um, focused on getting the Permanent International Criminal Court established, and in particular, in getting a crime of aggression established as part of the statute of that court. That sort of happened. It's there. It's not yet in effect. 2017 is the earliest day it can come into being. And Ben, age 95, has moved on to another concept where he is seeking to argue and to, he's doing the same thing as Lemkin, going round country after country trying to persuade them, trying to get them that a proper interpretation of crimes against humanity can outlaw the violence that is an inevitable part of the beginning of any conflict, the violence that will lead to breaches of the United Nations Convention and to the killing of individuals. He is, by that means, trying to introduce a concept, a concept that will be popular with the citizens, a concept that would say war is effectively unlawful. Uh, you'll find some citations in the um, uh, handout, but I won't read them because of the distance. So that, that's a couple of bits of history that show that we, the people, are not to be bound by we, the lawyers. We have rights of our own to conceive of crimes and criminality, and we have words that can describe them. Let's come now to Srebrenica and to the law that applied at the time, for I must deal with that to some extent. The most modern statute is the International Criminal Court statute, and you'll find that the crime of aggression, which we needn't trouble very much with, is defined and it's just simply waiting for 2017 before it comes into play, or may come into play. Article 6, when we come to Srebrenica, is what's important. It's genocide. And for the purposes of this statute, genocide means any of the following acts, and then you can see the following acts, killing, causing serious harm, inflicting group conditions of life, and so on. It's the underlying sentence that is absolutely critical. Committed with the intent to destroy, in whole or in part, a national, ethnical, racial, or religious group as such. With the intent to destroy. 
as opposed to crimes against humanity, which, um, although it does involve a mental state, has a different, a much wider and a much different meaning. It means acts committed as part of a widespread or systematic attack directed against any civilian population with knowledge of the attacks. It's a different concept. You'll find in the handout the mental state elements that are required one way or another of citizens. But let me make this point. The words of these statutes can be argued over and are argued over endlessly by lawyers and judges. But underneath it all, the point of importance for genocide is the intention. Now, intent, either in the language that the common law of England and America and Australia use, or in the other um, jurisdictions of the civil law where they use different but similar concepts, intent's not that difficult to understand. The, ca the catalogue of offences in our country of assault, starting with assault, uh, common assault and going up to um, malicious wounding with intent to wound, involve different gradations of assault, and they involve different gradations of mental state, of which the one at the very top is with intent to wound or with intent to cause serious bodily harm. Uh, you don't turn around in the pub and just happen to push the glass into somebody's face. You go up to him with intent to wound him. So we all understand the concept of intent. It's not actually that difficult. Well, it's not that difficult with a single person and a single offence. But once you come to look at a state that may be, through its uh, officers, committing an offence of genocide, things are very different. Conceive of state X against state Y. And in state X, you've got a president or a prime minister, you've got a field marshal, then you've got a couple of generals, General C and General D. And then you've got colonels and majors and captains and lieutenants and so on, all the way down. Now, everyone could be operating according to the rules of war, or everybody could have been infected by a genocidal intent, or some and some. The president, the field marshal, and maybe General C will all be law-abiding people at war. But that General D, he may harbour genocidal intent against the citizens of country Y. He may just wish to wipe them out because they are Ys, not Xs. Where does that leave the field marshal, the president? First of all, if they know a little bit. Second, if they suspect a bit. And they still let D do the work. Does D's part of the war become genocidal where the rest is not? Or suppose, and there's a reason for my mentioning this, suppose the international community comes along to uh, president and says, look, it's time this war was over. We won't be looking too hard. Bit of a blind eye old thing. And the field marshal thinks, well, the, the president thinks, well, the field marshal and General A are very proper soldiers. But And then he advises the field marshal to suggest that General A takes his leave. And it's all left, sorry, General C takes his leave and it's all left to General D. Where does this leave? The, the vulnerability of the president and the field marshal for any genocide that D commits. And that's exactly the sort of problem that is encountered when you try to look at this very particular crime for uh, what an army does through its individual memories, members. And as a result of that, and for other reasons, Genocide crimes have taken a great deal of time to unravel in the courts in which they've been tried. And um, one of the questions is whether that's something that is overall worthwhile. As to Srebrenica itself, it happened in July of 1995. By October of 1995, just as by way of example, the New York Times, and I've given you the citation and given you a summary in the handout, was able to write an extensive six-page article, as were all the other papers and the news media, 
setting out the history. They were able, of course, to rely on a couple of, um, or several videos of General Mladic, the man who took Srebrenica. So perhaps we'll have a look at those. You may remember some of them. Your husbands, your brothers, or your neighbours, says Mladic here, on the 12th of July, all you have to do is to say what you want. I told this gentleman you can survive or disappear. For your survival, I demand that all your armed men, all those committed, even the, the committed crimes, and many did against our people, surrender. Welcome to the army of the Republic of Srpska. And then the next one, which you'll be probably some of you familiar with or will have seen at the time, this is the day before. Here we are on the 11th of July. On the eve of yet another great Serb holiday, we give this town to the Serb people as a gift. Finally, after the rebellion against the Zais, the time has come to take revenge on the Turks in this region. That and many other bits of footage they had about Mladic. And the newspaper was able to report the way Mladic and his crew had weakened the United Nations generally so that they could not defend Srebrenica. The paper was able to report how people like Izabegovic, the president of Bosnia, feared the genocide that was to come. How the people were forced to get into Potichari and to be vulnerable to control by the Serbs. How eventually they were separated. How many people went on a column trying to escape from the Serbs but were picked off, taken off and killed in fields um, in uh, appalling acts of violence, how people from uh, the people who were separated out at Potichari were put in buses and taken off and killed. And they had survivors' accounts from people who'd laid underneath bodies and managed to wait for a whole night when the Serb forces or the Bosnian Serb forces thought that everyone was dead and eventually get up to tell the tale of the awful things that happened. Now, there's a lot more to be told, including like General Jean Vier, the French general in charge of the forces, declined the invitation to bomb the Serbs to save the Bosnian people, and who declined to do so for whatever reason, and so on. But by October 1995, can there really have been any doubt but that this was a crime that attracted a certain name? And yet, 20 years on, we are still trying people. Let me introduce you to Nana Trump, because although the summary that the New York Times could give was part of the evidence, and we have to decide just how can these things last quite so long. Of course, it wasn't the only evidence. Nana Trump, who's an academic from the Amsterdam University and who was a researcher in the Milosevic and other trials at the uh, Yugoslav Tribunal, may bring a different perspective. She may not necessarily hold the same views as I do. And I thought it would be helpful for you to hear from her some of the most important bits of evidence in her judgment that go to show that what happened here was indeed a genocide. Um, it will be helpful for all of us to look into the qualification, classification of genocide as articulated by Gregory H. Stanton, who is a um, Director General of Genocide Watch, a very helpful NGO. Uh, he re recognizes eight stages of genocide. First is classification, symbolization, dehumanization, organization, polarization, preparation, extermination, and the last stage is denial. Uh, in the parts of uh, uh, New York Times report, uh, Sir Jeffrey didn't read out for you for obvious reasons, there are many elements of these eight stages that have been recognized and out there in the field, but without conceptualization what genocide is that could mean, it is hard to recognize it necessarily. Classification starts with polarization 
in the society long before the process of extermination starts. And this class classification is actually a functional and cynical use of already existing cleavages in a society, either that are racial or religious or ethnical, and the process run by political elites actually uh, identifies through usually words, uh, them group and us group. And that doesn't by itself mean that the conflict is going to start, but step by step, there are uh, developments where outsider and observer could see that there might be a violence ahead. And one of the elements of genocide, which is very important and happens months and years ahead of extermination is dehumanization process. This is when the us group uh, portrays the them group as less human. It's a denial of human characteristics. So one of the uh, very telling example was in the colonial past when the colonial powers and, and people working overseas in the colonies uh, were made to think that uh, people of a different color do not suffer if you slap them, if you torture them, because they are less human than, than we are, us group is. And why is it important that I put all these eight stages here is in, uh, when we did um, research in genocidal crimes at the Yugoslavia tribunal, there are actually three important stages of uh, recognizing this process. One is pre-genocide stage, where up to 0.6 here, and what happens before genocide and why nothing had happened to prevent it. What happens during the genocide stage and during the extermination stage? Why is violence going on and no internal or external power uh, stops it, and uh, uh, eighth stage is post-violent uh, stage, post-genocide stage, what happens there, and denial of former us group is usually a very clear example that genocide has been uh, happening. Uh, so what I have done here to going back to uh, violence in Bosnia and Herzegovina uh, to show how and why genocide has been uh, a functional crime, the crime that had to be planned, planned uh, lo a very long period uh, before it, violence starts. And this map shows you the ethnic makeup of Bosnia and Herzegovina uh, according to the last census before the war and it was census of 91. Uh, as you could see, the patchwork of, uh, of ethnicities in Bosnia and Herzegovina shows uh, green color municipalities uh, with a Bosnian Muslim majority. The red colored municipalities have Serb majority, blue Croat, and all these different colors that you can see there are actually mixed mixtures. So the most important and most interesting mixture for us would be pink and brown because you have the almost uh, Muslim uh, majority, almost Serb majority. So uh, these are municipalities that are um, uh, visible here and pay attention to those patches in the reddish areas. These would be municipalities to go first. This map shows how Bosnia looked like after the war. Something very significant happened as, as a child was coloring the, the map and made territories homogeneous ethnically. And the question is, how did it happen? And the ways how it happened uh, comprised of a variety of crimes and one of the crimes charged was genocide as well. As well. So, showing that it wasn't uh, a spontaneous eruption of crimes from grassroots because ethnicity in Bosnia didn't like each other or even hated 
each other, as some uh, historians would claim, is this document. This is a document issued by um, Serb Democratic Party uh, of uh, Radovan Karadzic and the others, leader of uh, uh, Bosnian Serbs. And the document was already from December 91, before there was any question about the war at all in Bosnia. And it says that uh, action should be made so that the whole Bosnia should be divided in A and B uh, categories of municipalities. Variant A would be municipalities where Bosnian Serbs comprise the majority, so those red colored parts. And variant B we municipalities where the Serb population was in a minority. So uh, brown colored and very many green colored municipalities. Uh, so why should prosecution or a historian at all pay so much attention to a document produced by a simple political party that was even not in power? This is why uh, legal processes mean a lot, not just to determine whether individual is guilty or not guilty, but also to help historians to determine what actually happened. One of the people who was explaining what this document variant A and B meant was one of the members of the same party, Miroslav Deronic. He was a high school uh, teacher in Bratunac, a municipality in Eastern Bosnia with uh, which was colored brown, actually. And he said that at a meeting of his party with Radovan Karadzic present, they were instructed how to deal with each, he was a mayor of his municip municipality, Derenic, and uh, they explained that in the situations of variant B, uh, the uh, violence, is going to be applied. And what sort of violence? He mentioned paramilitary groups coming in, threatening and scaring non serb population, and with Yugoslav army at that time still SFRY uh, helping them out. Uh, that uh, document has been followed up in the next stage of the war. In this stage on 12th of May, Bosnia was already at war because it declared independence. And this is a follow-up which gave almost the whole game away what the Bosnian Serbs were doing in Bosnia and Herzegovina. First was, uh, first strategic objective was um, ethnic separation. Uh, and next. And these six strategic objectives objectives you can see very clearly in this map and you could see that the northern corridor that was the second strategic objective should be Serb and more problematically or equally problematically eastern corridor where Srebrenica was. So this map was there published in a, a state uh, uh, newspaper of Republika Srpska and this map actually showed the cynical geostrategic reasons for uh, for the war. You can see the uh, municipalities uh, here uh, extracted from Milosevic's um, indictment and you, could, you can clearly see that the violence has been charged in the municipalities as we now remember as variant A with a uh, Serb majority and especially those um, we should pay attention to those in, in greens because Srebrenica is part of it, if Jeffrey might show you. The, from that moment on, uh, it was obvious that violence in Bosnia is going to last long and uh, with the presence of international community and international media, it was inconceivable now to say that we didn't know what was going on. The more, most important question at this point, and for us here as well, is what does international community can do, or what, what 
what in this case international community did to, to stop it. This is one of the examples of what international community does, monitors the situation and this um, resolution was very, very important, uh, UN Security Council resolution, because for the first time it mentioned the crime of genocide and compelled the parties to stop it and especially asking from uh, Federal Republic of Yugoslavia, neighboring state, to do everything to prevent it. In the legal terms, this document was very important for us because it represents the part of the charges which is called notice. If you are on notice, don't do a crime and you still do it, then you are very guilty talking about intent. Uh, in between, from 93 to 95, there was a long period of trying to find a peace solution or a peace accord for Bosnia. Uh, it failed. And in 95 March, uh, Radovan Karadžić, the leader of Republika Srpska, issues a Directive 5, in which he says that the complete, to complete the physical separation of Srebrenica from Žepa as soon as possible, preventing even communication between individuals in the two enclaves. By planned and well thought out combat operations, create an unbearable situation of total insecurity with no hope of further survival or life for the inhabitants of Srebrenica. Uh, next uh, evidence, very important, was now after the Commission of Genocide. These documents represent stages before genocide happened and the fact that nothing has been done to prevent it. Diplomatic cables were a very important piece of, of evidence which uh, Sir Geoffrey asked us to send to Belgrade, to capital of uh, a federal uh, Republic of Yugoslavia, former. And he said, because we didn't have uh, lots of evidence what they exactly did in Belgrade, uh, we asked them to show us what their diplomatic representatives were reporting about Srebrenica in New York, Paris and London. So he said, okay, if you claim you didn't know anything, what did you, representatives outside the world, all over the world knew? And the reports we got were very, very important. This one was a report uh, coming to uh, uh, Belgrade on 25th of July, and the representative from America uh, says that, yes, everyone was very concerned the whole international community, what had happened in Srebrenica, but they will all forget about it, less, and no one would care about Jepa. At the same day, Jepa was conquered with the, almost the same consequences as in Srebrenica. And very important moment, what happened during the, the uh, combat in, uh, and military activities in Srebrenica, comes from Supreme Defense Council records, which some of you who had followed Sir Jeffrey's um, lectures before saw a few examples of. Uh, this is a commander chief of armed forces from Yugoslavia. So what we are now trying to, and at the court, in the court, what we try to do is to say, okay, we have uh, evidence what uh, Republika Srpska and Bosnian Serbs did, but how do we connect it with Belgrade? Could Republika Srpska do it by itself? And how these strategic objectives actually feature in the politics of Belgrade? And this uh, uh, important document shows that Slobodan Milosevic talked during the takeover of Srebrenica in Mladic. Uh, he did not prevent it. So here, in the world, there are two ways to look into crimes in Srebrenica. One is that the whole world knew that Srebrenica, there will be takeover of Srebrenica, and they sort of uh, said, okay, we should do it, but no one expected that after takeover, genocide would take place. So this conversation is very important because Milosevic had power over Mladic, even if Mladic committed genocide without Milosevic giving him green light, why nothing did happen to Mladic subsequently. And another piece of evidence that you had seen, some of you who attended the lectures before, 
is this execution of uh, uh, prisoners, uh, detainees, war prisoners taken in Srebrenica and Zepa almost three weeks afterwards, after the crime happened. So again, it showed the intent because if the politicians wanted to stop it, they would have stopped it immediately. And this is a very interesting piece of evidence that we found, uh, not, actually not even by chance. Most of these documents or, and uh, uh, elements I, I've shown you have been published in open sources. And this is um, a reaction by a Serb diplomat, former Minister of Foreign Affairs, who was sent as a, a representative of Serbia in UN after the fall of Srebrenica as a, as a, a, a troubleshooter. And a, a UN compelled all the states to come to UN with their stories what actually happened. And he comes, sends a letter to Lavrov, the Russian representative, which he said that actually what happened is that Bosnian Muslim army in Srebrenica didn't want to surrender, and those who wanted to surrender were killed by their own army. So that Serbia or Bosnian Serbs had nothing to do with it. That was a very compelling evidence as a, and part of this process of denial, as we discussed now. Uh, making the circle full and trying to find out how Republika Srpska and their army uh, worked together with uh, Belgrade. Uh, we have analyzed Supreme Defense Council documents, and this one comes after successful completion of negotiations in Dayton and peace for Bosnia where Sloboda Milosevic actually says a great victory has been simply won, and result of it is that Republika Srpska has been created, occupying half of the territory of Bosnia and Herzegovina. And throughout these documents, we could find in the words uh, agreement and consultation between Belgrade and Pale. A massive evidence of which this is only uh, a chosen sample by an expert. None of the evidence was against this having been a genocide. Pretty well, all of it confirmed the picture. And yet, case after case, and there's a very good ICTY, the Yugoslav Tribunal website, I've given you an explanation of how to use it. For any who are interested, it's the most accessible and easily used document that can show you precisely what the evidence was in case after case. But it took forever and is still going on. And here you see some of the victims, the mothers of Srebrenica, and other victim groups. What have they got out of the process? No compensation, or almost no compensation for the loss of their fathers, brothers, sons, even where they were the financial breadwinners. The UN has provided no compensation fund for them, despite the pleading of one of its presidents, Judge Robinson. Individual offenders can't be pursued for, for example, compensation, and the only political entity that has been identified so far, the Republic of Srpska, apart from Serbia itself as responsible, can't be pursued because it's part of Bosnia itself by reason of the very strange construction of that state following the Dayton agreements in the end of 1995. And these people, some of them here, their reaction to what the ICTY the, and the other courts have done may initially have been quite positive. There were findings of genocide, after all. But before long, they became less positive. The length of the trial, the excessive rights accorded to the accused, where there were no parallel rights for victims, caused distress. The pomp of the Western style justice may initially have been appealing, less so now. And some calculate that of the witnesses who gave evidence over the last 20 years, only 50% of those who are still alive would be prepared to give evidence now. They find the prisoners coming home to live after they've completed their sentences while the tribunal is still in operation, unacceptable. But of all the things that have upset the mothers of Srebrenica and the other 
uh, victims and bereaved of what happened, nothing is probably more disappointing for them than the decision of the International Court of Justice, the ICJ, which tries state-state issues, and which tried a case of genocide or breach of the Genocide Convention brought by Bosnia against Serbia, in which the court accepted that genocide had happened, but uh, held that Serbia wasn't responsible for anything more than failing to stop genocide. In short, it concluded that there was not an adequate control by Serbia proper over the soldiers and officers it was paying for in uh, Republika Srpska, despite all the evidence there was of measures of control that we were able to lay before our court and that were available to be laid before the International Court of Justice. They found that the Scorpion group, the group that committed those horrible executions we may have seen on a video, was not a part of the org was not an organ as defined uh, in the relevant laws, and therefore wasn't something for which Serbia itself should be held responsible. So the victims of Srebrenica got nothing from the International Court of Justice apart from these pyrrhic victories which sounded in no compensation and no real sanction of the state. Interestingly enough, and again, very easy to find on the ICJ's website, is that the vice president of that same court, Judge al Sanwe, dissented on grounds that Serbia's involvement uh, was indeed as the principal actor or accomplice in the genocide that took place. And he said that, in fact, this was supported by massive and compelling evidence. He disagreed with his 14 colleagues' methodology for dealing with facts. He disagreed with the fact that they steered clear of asking for evidence that had only come to them in a blacked-out, covered-up version that suited Serbia's interest. He disagreed with their reluctance to infer that genocidal intent could be caused, could be uh, drawn by inference from all the evidence that was before the court. And he found that, the, um, that Serbia had knowledge of the, gener the genocide that was to unfold in Srebrenica and that that knowledge was clearly established. He also felt that the, the uh, Scorpion paramilitary group was indeed an organ of the uh, Serbian government and that the Serbian government had indeed made what amounted to a confession after the showing of that video to their culpability. It's quite interestingly interesting to see quite how strong is the language used by one judge of the world's top court about his colleagues. The court, he says, has refer refused to infer genocidal intent from the consistent pattern of conduct in Bosnia-Herzegovina. In its reasoning, the court relies heavily on several arguments, each of which is inadequate for the purpose and contradictory to the consistent jurisprudence of the international criminal tribunals. He went on to make this point, that this court, his brother judges, or brother and sister judges, ignores the facts and substitutes its own assessment of how the Bosnian Serbs could, hypothetically, have best achieved their macabre strategic goals. But he observes and reminds his brother and sister judges. The applicant isn't asking the court to evaluate whether the Bosnian Serbs were efficient in achieving their objectives. He said, the applicant is asking the court to look at the, pap the applicant being Bosnia, is asking the court to look at the pattern of conduct and draw the logically necessary inferences. And he goes on to say, if the only objection, objective was to move the Muslim population and the court is willing to assume that the Bosnian Serbs did only that which is strictly necessary in order to achieve this objective, then what, one, what was one to make of mass murder? He wasn't the only judge, by the way, who, um, of that group who found cause for complaint in what the, the, the court had done for one of his... Uh, fellow judges, um, I'll come back to that in a second, also found in very trenchant terms that the court was quite wrong not to engage in an exercise of evidence gathering. 
Now, what does this show us about the legal systems to which victims, victims of 8,000 unnecessary killings can turn? Victims who, after 20 years, have lost their enthusiasm that they may have had for the international legal process. Marley Simons is an extremely experienced, very senior, totally trustworthy reporter or journalist for the New York Times. And after the judgment was given by the International Court of Justice, she wrote a very detailed article, and I've given you the citation for it in the paper. She deals with the documents that were blacked out, and didn't have a chance to deal with that in great detail, but you've seen them before. Documents were blacked out for the Yugoslav Tribunal, and the International Court of Justice didn't bother to look at what was behind the blacked out bit for some reason. Um, and therefore they missed what were the best, or as it were, the very worst bits of this document. She also explained how a member of the Serbian team that had managed to have those documents blacked out couldn't believe their luck when they got away with it. She dealt with how um, a former president of another part of the former Yugoslavia, Montenegro, President Momir Bulatovic, explained the significance in a book he published of the meetings um, of which those blacked out documents were a record. Um, she also had the courage, and I suppose the status as a very senior um, reporter of similar age, to go and approach the president of the court, Rosalind Higgins, the world's top judge, I suppose you could say, and say, well, why did you do this? Why didn't you get more evidence? The judge said, the ruling speaks for itself. Uh, the other judge who I've spoken of was the judge that she referred to, Judge Ahmed Mahiou of Algeria, who said, this is the quote I was looking for, he said of the judge, his brother judges, he said that the judges have given several reasons for not getting more evidence, um, none of them sufficiently convincing including a fear of creating the impression that the court was taking sides. Well, hello. Courts are there to take sides, ultimately. The court was taking sides. So if you can't take sides in the gathering of evidence, I don't know how you're ever going to take sides at the end of it. But also that it might intrude on the sovereignty of a state and that it might have embarrassed Serbia. Or that the court might have been embarrassed if Serbia had refused. She also spoke to Antonio Cassesi, sadly now no longer with us, but one of the first presidents of the Yugoslav Tribunal and an eminent international jurist, asked about the failure to look for the documents. Cassese said, well, I was rather taken aback that they didn't see the documents, but it's not an aggressive court, a very traditional civil court, he said. That gave something to everybody. Are courts dealing with these issues? designed to give something to everybody. And Marley Simons was also able to produce a reported observation by a member of the Serbian legal team at the International Court of Justice, who was confronted with the suggestion that the Serbian team hadn't told the truth. And he said, it's normal. Every country will do everything possible to protect the state. Bosnia wanted a lot of money for damages. And as to the suggestion that someday the truth would emerge, he said, oh, that's the future. Now it's important to protect the state. Well, do you see perhaps now why I started off with the suggestion that some concepts of law, this concept that Lemkin gave us of genocide, a word we are now all able to use, is perhaps better trusted to us than it is necessarily trusted with great confidence to courts. For when the vice president of the world's court is at complete odds with the majority, and when another member is unable to understand why the court declined to seek available evidence for fear of causing itself embarrassment, you may ask, why should the victims respect the law that much? Why should they not follow their own judgment in the use of the word that Lemkin made available to them? 
But if they do that, if we do that, other responsibilities follow. And they follow because, as I explained in an earlier lecture, law can be used and abused to write or to rewrite history. It remains possible, just, for this Bosnian government, this present Bosnian government, to seek revision of the unsatisfactory judgment that causes Bosniaks, the uh, Muslims of Bosnia, so much dissatisfaction and unhappiness. If it doesn't try to revise that judgment, then the words of the majority judges, however wrong, may prevail and they may be impossible ever to correct, even by future historians. Today's Bosnians should not seek reasons not to try to have that judgment revised. For example, they shouldn't rely on the fact that both Serbia and Croatia failed in their tit-for-tat allegations recently, failed in their tit-for-tat allegations of genocide against each other. And they should recognise that the Bosnian case for genocide against Serbia is perhaps the strongest of any genocide allegations arising out of the conflicts in the former Yugoslavia, and that Bosnia should honour its dead and its living by seeking to correct a record that may be wrong. I look forward to seeing you after you've all had a pleasant Easter. Thank you.